God bless you, beloved. I pray that all is well. I pray that you are doing fine on today. Listen, I just wanted to give you a word of encouragement, and I pray, I pray that it blesses you. Amen. And I was, it came to me about doubt cannot stay here. You must protect your peace. Amen. Doubt cannot stay here. You must protect your peace. So let's go into a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for what you have done and for what you're going to do, God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being the author, Lord God, and the finisher of our faith. We thank you, Lord God, that we understand and know that God you see and you know everything there is about us and you love us oh god heavenly father i thank you and we thank you together lord god that you are peace and that you are strength you are joy you are very present help in the time of trouble heavenly father i ask oh god that you would bind the adversary today god come against oh god Lord God, every attack of the enemy, God, that would create confusion and chaos in the lives of those your beloved, oh God. Heavenly Father, I ask right now in the name of Jesus that you would gird their loins and their minds, oh God, and Lord God, cover them with your precious anointed blood. Give them, Lord God, protection against the hand of the enemy, God. Give them strength, Lord God, to be able to stand and to withstand all the fiery darts of the wicked. Lord, I ask right now in the name of Jesus, yes, God, that you would defeat the purpose and the plans of the enemy, God, in their finances, in their health, oh God, in their mental state, God, and in, Lord God, their jobs and in their ministries, oh God, and in their faith, oh God. Heavenly Father, I ask, oh God, that you would keep them, Lord God, in the hour of temptation, God, they will not submit to the temptation, God, that you would make a way of escape, Lord God, whereby they're able, oh God, to overcome the wicked one. Heavenly Father, I ask, oh God, that you would lead them and guide them and direct them, oh God, Lord God, in every decision, oh God, in every, Lord God, contract, in every plan land, God, in every vision, every dream, and every goal. Heavenly Father, I ask, oh God, that you would give them guidance and direction, God, as to what your will is for their life, oh God. Help them, Lord God, to be covered by, Lord God, your word, oh God. Keep them in the center and in the will of your word, oh God. Keep them, Lord God, when the enemy, oh God, is pressing against them, oh God, to get them out of the place of obedience, oh God, and to get them into the place of disobedience and cause them, Lord God, to pull away from, Lord God, the thing which gives them life. Lord God, I ask, oh God, that you would strengthen each and every soul that is listening to this dream. I ask, oh God, that you would fight the forces of darkness, oh God. They're even fighting those, oh God their loved ones, oh God, are behind prison bars, oh God. I ask, oh God, that you would deliver them and set them free from the hand of the enemy, God. I ask, oh God, that you would visit them right now, even in that jail cell. I ask, oh God, the word of strength and deliverance, oh God, would come unto them, God. I ask, oh God, that you would break the chains of darkness all around them, oh God. I ask in the name of Jesus, yes, God, that you would save their souls, oh God. And I ask, oh God, that you would deliver them, Lord God. Let the case be dismissed, oh God. Let there be a change, oh God, on the end side of their heart, oh God. Bring them out, Lord Jesus, with a mighty hand and stretched out arm, Lord God. Lord, deliver those, oh God, that you know are ready for change, oh God, and those that you're still working on, Lord God. Perfect that which concerns them, oh God. And Lord, help them to know that you love them and that you do care for them, God. Bless and save each and every one of our young people, Lord God. I ask, oh God, that you would not let this generation be lost, oh God. But I ask, oh God, that you would bring them to the place, oh God, of repentance, oh God, and true deliverance, oh God, in their body, soul, mind, and spirit. Lord, I ask, oh God, that you would come against the spirit of promiscuity, God, that is running rampant against, oh God, our Lord God, loved ones, and even our young people. Lord, help them, Lord God, to abstain from sex, oh God, and keep themselves for their husbands and their wives, oh God. Lord, between a man and a woman, Heavenly Father, I ask, oh God, that you would destroy the power and the influence of Satan, oh God, even in the workforce right now, in the name of Jesus. And I ask, oh God, that you would come against, oh God, every demonic spirit, oh God, that is raising one attack against them right now, God. Lord, I ask, oh God, that you would just send your angels, oh God, of deliverance, oh God. And I thank you, Lord God, for this word, Lord God, minister it unto their hearts, oh God. Lord God, begin to encourage and to uplift, oh God. Make my lips as lips of clay, God. Lord, let it not be me, Lord God, but let it be Christ inside me, oh God. Let your spirit dominate this conversation, God. Let your spirit rule over me, God. And Lord, you be the teacher, Lord God, and I will be the student, oh God. Lord God, you be the master, Lord God, and I will be the servant, oh God. And Lord, I ask, oh God, that your spirit, oh God, would take full and complete control over this word and study in Jesus' name. And I thank you, and it's already done. Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you, beloved. I'm so glad you were able to join me on today. So I wanted to minister this word, 
And I pray that truly it blesses you. Some may see it on Sunday and some may see it on Monday. But nonetheless, I pray that ministers truly unto you. And if you like what you are hearing, please do me a favor. I'm asking everyone to like and subscribe. Will you do that for me? Like and subscribe to Word and Power with Sister Carletta B. And also we come on Monday, Wednesday, and we have our lives on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Listen, guys, pray for me. I'm still trying to do better with my time. So please, please continue to um, tune in. I pray that this is truly a blessing to you and that it helps you throughout your week. All right? Okay, so let's go into the Word of God. And as we're in uh, Matthew, we're in St. Matthew, the 14th chapter, starting at the 22nd verse down to, I think we're going to uh, go down, probably down to the 36th as the Lord leads. But we're starting at uh, chapter 14, Matthew's 14 chapter at the 22nd verse. And what we're talking about, we're talking about doubt. So where does doubt come from? Doubt means to have an uncertainty of mind. That means not sure. And when you're not sure, it means normally if things that you're not sure of why, because things are not, they may or may not happen. Now, it does not mean that you have no faith. It just means that you're not sure. And that it means that you have an uncertainty. That's what to doubt means. It means, doubt means uncertainty. Your uncertainty means to be not sure. It means that you are in a place, again, where things may or may not happen. And where does that come from? Many times our experiences in life, when they're not favorable and when we have challenges and, and when things, you know, do not pan out or plan out the way that we had anticipated or expected for them to, we tend to lean to the side of just thinking in our mind that it may never happen. And so when we get close enough to something getting ready to happen or a blessing or the favor of God or the miracle of God, we tend to go into that mindset of doubting. Why? Because of past experiences and past situations that have happened, that have you know taken place in our lives. And so we go, our mind draws back to, I don't know if he can really do it. Remember the man whose son was grievously vexed with the devil. And so he said to Jesus, he said, Lord, I believe, help thou, help thou mine unbelief. In other words, I believe that, that you're God. I believe that you can do this. But then there's a part of me that has that, that unbelief, okay? So we know that doubt, it means to be having uncertainty. It means to have, to be not sure. It means that you're not, you, you're not sure that things are going to happen, okay? But then when you have unbelief, unbelief means that you are in that place where you believe but your faith is being what? It's being attacked. How many of you have your faith being attacked? I want to stay on the word doubt, but I just want to touch a little bit on unbelief. Unbelief means to a refusal to accept and appropriate God's truth. Okay, again, that means refusal to accept and to appropriate what? God's truth. That means when when the children of Israel could not enter in because of what unbelief, they had a refusal to accept and to appropriate what God's truth. The word of God, remember I told you, the word of God is God in written form. So when he speaks, he speaks from his what? His word, because he is the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word did what? It dwelt among us. Okay, it was made flesh and it dwelt among us. So when you hear the word of God, the scripture says faith comes by hearing. Amen. And hearing by what? The word of God. So your faith starts to increase by what you hear. And when you hear what you're hearing, when you're hearing the word of God, that causes your faith to increase. Does that make sense? In other words, the more of the word of God that you study and you hear and you understand, it causes your faith to what? Expand. It causes your faith to multiply. It causes it to what? To increase. It causes your faith to grow. Okay? And so what happens is, is that the enemy tries to do what? He tries to 
put doubt in there when God has placed the word in there. So we know that Satan is what the counterfeit. He tries to duplicate everything that God himself is and is doing and what he represents. And so you have to understand that it's not uncommon that the enemy is going to try to make you doubt. Remember, we talked about how the sower sold the word. Okay, and the sower is representation of the definition of a farmer. What does a farmer do? He plants seeds. Why does he plant seeds? Because he is looking for what a harvest for from the seeds that he has planted. So we take that into the spiritual sense. The spiritual sense, as in terms, and I haven't forgotten uh, my text, the spiritual sense and how he talks about that which is amongst the wayside. Having heard the word of God, then after they hear the word, the devil comes what? He immediately, he takes the word that they, which was sown out of what? Out of their mouth. Why? Because he doesn't want it to have root and he doesn't want you to grow from the word that you have just received. Then he talks about that which is upon stony ground, that which is upon thorns, that which is what? On good ground. So that which is amongst thorns, if we can very quickly to go to it, because you have to understand there is a strategy of the enemy to cause the word of God that you have just heard to be what? To be deleted. Have you ever deleted someone out of your phone as soon as they sent you a text message and then all of a sudden that message, once you got it, some people delete and some people hold on to it just in case they need what? A quick reference to go back to it. So beloved, you got to hold on to what? the word of God. Why? Because it is your quick reference in the time that you need it. So here it is when he talks about that which is what? That which is sown. Your ground is what? Your, your heart is the ground where the word of God, this, the word of God is the seed. Okay? The word of God is the seed. So when you plant the word of God in your heart, it's going to produce a harvest. And so your faith is growing by what you're hearing through the word of God. That's why it's very important to study the word of God, not just read it to study because you can read um, a novel, you can read instructions, but when you're studying, you are investigating, you're researching, okay? And you're taking the scriptures that are in the middle as support scriptures, okay, as a point of reference to the other scriptures that you are studying. And so what you're doing is, and also it's good to have a three-in-one uh, dictionary, Bible dictionary, so that you are able to apply the definition of what that word means to the scriptures, amen, and vice versa. So here it is, and very quickly, I just want to do an overview of that. He says, hear ye therefore the parable of the sword. This is in Matthew 13. He says, when one heareth the kingdom of when one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by what the wayside. So when you're hearing the word by the wayside, I, I just want to make sure that I, um, please forgive me. He says, when you're hearing the word by the wayside, so this is that which is what? By the wayside, when you're hearing the word of God. Then the devil comes and does what? Immediately he snatches it out of your heart because he doesn't want it to do what? He doesn't want it to take root in there. And then it talks about he that receiveth seed amongst what? Stony places, the same as he that heareth the word. And what? He receives it with joy, and yet he hath no root in himself. That means he has no depth in him. In other words, the word of God has not had a chance to what? Take root in there. So I don't, excuse me, y'all. It doesn't have a chance to take root in there. And so what takes place is I probably got those two uh, transposed. But anyway, please forgive me. And that's all right because we want to make sure we get the understanding of the word. I want to be able to uh, speak the word of God correctly. So here it is. He says, but he that received this uh, seed amongst what? Stony places. In other words, if your heart is filled, when you receive the word of God, and you receive it with joy. You got to remember how you hear the word of God is very important of how the word of God is going to be what? Planted inside of you. Because how you're hearing the word, your, your heart is the ground. And what you're hearing, how you're hearing the word of God. In other words, how you're receiving it. 
and how you're ingesting the word and how you're protecting that word that you're hearing. In other words, you're not letting the word which is sown in your heart leave out of your heart. You're meditating on that word that you have received. You're holding on to that word that you get, that has just been what deposited inside of you so that you don't lose faith, so that you don't go into the place where when the enemy confronts you or he challenges you with doubt, your, your spirit is not going to immediately receive what he is what depositing in your spirit. Why? Because you remember what the word of God is saying. So you're able to repeat the word of God back to him to let him know, no, this is what the word of God is saying. So I choose to believe what the word of God. And when you choose to believe what God says versus what the devil is trying to what feed you and what he's trying to throw at you, it combats that spirit of doubt so that you do not walk in a place of uncertainty and i'm not sure you walk in a, a place of what confidence so as we continue here it says and i very quickly want to get through this he says this portion of it he said yet he hath no root in himself why does he have no root in himself because the word of god is not taking depth in the individual in other words you're not allowing the word of god to 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 stick in your heart to get on the inside of your heart See, the word of God has to get on the inside of your heart so that when you get it on the inside of your heart, you guard that word. You protect that word. You don't let the enemy talk you out of what? Talk you out of what the word of God is saying. Why? Because you understand it now. You know what it's saying. And you're not going to let the enemy um, try to play games and tricks on your mind to cause you to say, well, God said he was going to do it, but he hasn't done it yet. No, the scripture says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will do what? Strengthen thy heart. In other words, this is what the word of God is saying. Remember when Jesus was being tempted, after he had fasted, he gave the enemy the word. Why? He gave Satan the word. Why? Because the enemy came to tempt him. Everything that was deposited in Jesus, here it is, the enemy wanted to what? He wanted to take it away from him. He couldn't take it away from him because he was the word himself. And he created Lucifer, who when Lucifer thought that he was going to be like the Most High, God did what? He, he kicked him out of heaven. Amen? So here it is. And a third went with him. So here it is. We understand and know that you have to be careful, that you have to guard the word. Here it is, that which is what? Among stony places. He says, having heard the word, the same as he that heareth the word, and with joy, and anon with joy receive it, and at once he receives it, yet because he doesn't have root in himself, he endure for what? A while. That means he only lasts for a while. That means that word is lasting for what? A little bit. You receive it, but then you let the enemy, thank you, Jesus, you allow yourself to not allow the word of God to take root. And so what happens is immediately it says here, when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by they are offended. Why? You're offended because you didn't let the word get down on the inside of your heart, down to the bone, down to the soul. The scripture lets us know that his word is what? Quick, powerful, and sharper than what? Any two-edged sword. So we have to let the word get on the inside. When it gets on the inside and it's rooted in us, that means anything that is deep-rooted, you've got to take something that is stronger than that which is being deposited in you and to uproot it. Does that make sense? Okay, and then he says here, he also that receives seed amongst the thorn is he also that cures the word and the cures of the world. This is the ones amongst the, that takes the word that when you receive it and because you are, you are caught up with the things of the world, you choke on the word, okay? This is why he talks about that which is amongst thorns. Having hear, heard the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness, the misleadingness of riches, you choke on the word and become of what? Unfruitful. That means it's not producing Christ-like fruit. Why? Because it's not reproducing the word. It's not producing the seed of righteousness and godliness in you. Why? Because you're being caught with the things of the world. And so what happens is that which is amongst thorns, you're hearing the word, but then you get caught up with the things of the world. And so the word and the deceitfulness and the riches, and you start looking at those things. And so you're hearing it and you're, you're, you're hearing it, 
and you're not allowing it to be digested enough so that you're able to cast out the things of the world and refuse the things of the world. It's like a person that is hearing the word of God and then you get caught up with, with the world system and you're more concerned about the things of the world and trying to do the things of the world. Remember, you can't mix the two. You either got to love God and hate the, the scripture says, he that will be a friend of God. If you're a friend of the world, you're enemy with God. So here it is. We understand if enemy will come after Christ, you have to first deny yourself, take up your cross and what? Follow him. There is another scripture that just came to my mind and Heavenly Father, bring it back to me. And it reminds us that you are like no servant. Thank you, Lord can have two masters. Either he will love the one and hate the other. Either he will hold to the one or despise the other. you got to make a choice and a decision because the word of God is not going to be fruitful in you when you're trying to serve God and trying to serve the world at the same time. Now, understand this. You have to live in the world and you have to work to make a living. But when you are consumed, what it's talking about, it's a difference in when you're trying to live according to the system of the world. And in, in other words, trying to be a believer and trying to also be one that is still trying to sin in the world. Does that make sense? In other words, you can't be a believer and try to hold on to the world and serve the devil at the same time. You got to make a decision. You got to make a choice. Amen. Choose you this day whom you will serve. So here it is, he says, and lastly but not least, he says, but the, he that receiveth seed, in other words, you're receiving the word into the good ground, is the same person that is hearing the word. Now remember, your heart is the ground. So how you're hearing the word is how the word is going to affect you and how you're going to allow that word to affect you and how you're going to allow that word to govern and direct your life. Here it is, he said, he that receiveth seed into the good ground, is he that heareth the word and understandeth that which what he's hearing and he's what able to do what which heareth the, he, excuse me and heareth it which also bear fruit and bringeth forth what now this is the same one this is one that is hearing the word because he's one on good ground a person that's on good ground having heard the word and understanding it that's important. you got to hear the word and understand it. So when you're hearing the word and understanding it, your faith is growing. Your faith is multiplying. Your faith is increasing. And what happens? You're going to bring forth some what? 30, some 60, and some what? And hundredfold. What happens? You're receiving what you're hearing, and you're allowing that word not to leave your heart. Why? Because you're holding on to it, and you understand what it's saying. So when the enemy comes at you, and he tries to fight you with what uncertainty and trying to make you unsure about what God is saying. God says, how be it when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you. Amen. He will, how be it when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you. Okay. And what is, what is, whatever he hears, that is what he's going to speak. He's going to what? He's going to speak of himself. He's going to speak the word of God. Why? He said he will not speak of himself, but he's going to speak that which he's hearing. So he's going to bring forth his word back to your remembrance, that which he is what? Deposited inside of you, that which you have received and understood. So here it is. The spirit of doubt comes at a time when, when we see here in Matthew, and it's very um, poignant because what's happening here is Jesus is instructing his disciples to go over unto the other side to get into the ship and to go over unto the other side where are they going they're going unto bethesda and so what he does is he himself he stays on land but really what he's doing is he's getting ready to he's sending the multitude away the multitude is a large gathering of people that's what a multitude is it's a large gathering of people it can be a large amount of money that's what it means but in this context, it's talking about a large gathering of people. He's sending them away while he is what? He's sending his disciples to get on the ship. He first tells them to get on the ship. Okay. And the word constrain means to compel. He's forcing them as a force of action. But really what he's doing, he's compelling them. He's telling them to get, he's ordering them to get on the ship. 
and to do what? To go into the other side. The other side means to go into Bethesda. And then he himself, well, he sends the large multitudes away. The large gathering the people away. And after he sends the, what? The multitude away, the large gathering the people away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. Apart means alone. That means exclusive. Okay? So we understand that what he's doing is, and it means um, alone. It means exclusive of anyone or anything else. That means he himself alone is going apart by himself into this mountain. Why? To pray. Because he needs to get some alone time with himself. Okay? Remember, Jesus is God. So what is he doing? He's praying unto himself. He's praying unto the Father. And so what he's doing is, is when the evening has come, he is there, what, alone. But now, here we see a situation where the ship, it says in verse 24 of St. Matthew, St. Matthew 14 chapter, the 24th verse, it says, and you can also read different versions of this in Mark 6, 45 and 56, also in John 6, chapter 6, verses 15 and 21. In chapter 24, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Okay, and then it says, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on where on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when he was, and when Peter was come down out of what? The ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying of a truth, Thou art the Son of God. And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Genesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all the country round about and brought him into all and brought unto him all that were diseased and brought and besought him that they that they might only touch the hem of his garment and as many as touched were made perfectly whole. Now here it is. He is now, he's sending a large number of people away. He is alone. He's praying. But then in verse 24, but the ship was now in where? In the midst of the sea because they're rolling and they're toiling. Okay? He sees them. And what is causing this? And the scripture lets us know that the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves. For the wind was contrary. So here we see here that the ship was now in the midst of the sea. They're rolling and they're toiling. But what is causing the waves? Waves come when there is a friction between wind and surface water. So when the wind and surface water come together, it creates a friction or a turbulence or a disturbance of the peace that is on that water and the calm that is on that water. So basically what is happening is, is that the wind itself is being what? Contrary. Anything that is contrary, that means it is antagonistic. It is it is basically acting out of character. It is opposite in character. So we see here that the wind itself is a little turbulent. And the wind is what being antagonistic. It is not behaving itself. And so it's causing the friction of the water, okay, the water to be what? To, to create waves, which is causing the ship to toss back and forth. Here it is. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them. Remember, he was in a mountain praying, but he sees them. He sees them trying to get a hold of this of this ship, trying to get a handle on it. But what's causing the a turbulence and causing the wind to toss, which is causing uh, 
this the seed to toss with the waves is basically the wind with the water okay which is causing it to go back and forth that's where the waves come forth from and here it is in the fourth watch of the night jesus went unto them walking on the sea and i just thought about that why is jesus not not dealing with the wind why isn't he calming the wind remember there was another situation where he said peace be still okay because they said master cares thou not for the repairs that was in when he was asleep on a ship he was down under sleeping on the ship and there was you know the the wind and the sea and it was tossing the ship back and forth and so here it is in this situation i was thinking you know lord why didn't you speak to the wind itself pretty much many of us have situations where we are facing turbulence in our lives and the wind the wind represents that that beating forth of trying to make you bend when troubles rise and tests and trials come and tribulation come when distresses come meaning when distresses which are afflictions and attacks or should i say persecutions which are attacks come they come to get you to bend they come to get you to be in a place of uh, fear they come to give you um, doubt they come to get you into a place of lord what's going on i don't understand what you're doing i don't understand why all of this is happening so the wind a wind moves back and forth you can't see it but you can feel it and the effects of the wind the wind can basically in some cases i, I have to retract this some cases the wind will take and the scripture talks about when jesus was ministering unto nicodemus he said you can't see the wind but you can feel it you can hear it you don't know where it's going or where it's coming but you can certainly feel that wind and you can feel the effect of that wind and that's pretty much how when you're going through tests and trials you can feel the adverse effects of the storm that you are in when the enemy is coming against you you know on your job when he's coming against you through your family members, when it's coming against you, through your finances, through your health. There are all kinds of attacks that the enemy uses to what? To try to get you into a place where he creates disturbance. He tries to disrupt what? Your peace. And so he tries to get you out of that place of certainty and faith. Because when you have faith in God and you believe God and you trust God, because you cannot, the more that you walk with God, and the more that you study the word of God, God causes your faith to grow. And so what happens is, what is he doing? He's causing you to have a an experience with him that when the enemy comes against you, you have a witness and a testimony in itself that no matter what you come against me, it may be something, and this may be your first trial in this situation, but this is not your first rodeo of being or your first you know experience of being with god and god brought you out god brought you through god brought the, brought you through all kinds of tests and trials and then giving you the victory how can you know that god is a healer unless you were sick how can you know that he's a deliverer unless god delivered you out of situations he delivered you out of car crashes he healed your body of cancer healed you of sicknesses and diseases he delivered you from smoking he delivered you from crack cocaine he delivered you from all addictions he delivered you from what domestic violence he he delivered you when, when your car was about to go over a cliff. How do you know he's a deliverer or a protector? Why? Because God allows you to go through it to be able to come out and to know that you're still standing. And he was the one that gave you the victory. He was the one that gave you that, that strength to be able to keep standing. And sometimes you have to pinch yourself. I remember I had a situation where I said, Lord, if I make it out of this, I got to pinch myself. And, and, and God let me remind me, pinch yourself. I brought you through this. Why? Because you're still here. You're still living. You're still existing. And so sometimes in life, God has to remind us that you are not here by happenstance. I'm the one that brought you through this. So whenever you face a moment of doubt, whenever you face a moment where you're not sure that you're going to get through this, many times David felt the same way. He thought that he was going to die by the hand of Saul and God brought him through. Many times, my God, when there were those those who in the word of God, when you think about Joshua, he was fighting for the children of Israel, bringing them into the promised land. There were times that, you know, he fell on his face before God because he knew and he trusted God that he would bring them into that land. 
caused them to inherit and possess it. And when he was faced with Achan, taking of their curse, then he thought it was the children of Israel's fault. You know, he thought there was something wrong, you know, with what his instruction and him not obeying God's voice. And basically he said, Israel have sinned and have transgressed what violated my laws and my commandments. So he had to check him and to let him know, get up. He said, it wasn't you. He said, there was somebody in the camp that disobeyed my orders. In other words, he has to remind us, don't doubt me. If I say that I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. His word that go forth out of his mouth, he would not, ret would not return to him void. He would do and accomplish that which he pleased and prosper into the place that he has sent it. Why? Because he's God Almighty. When he could swear by no other, when he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. By two immutable things, it's impossible for God to lie. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Have he not spoken and shall he not do it? Have he not spoken and shall he not make it good? Here it is, Jesus is now looking at them and he comes in the fourth watch of the night he comes and he does what he walks on the sea and this this just came to me just before ministering this why doesn't he rebuke the wind you know why because he's letting you know that while he's walking on the water he's giving the stability of your situation to let you know that I'm in the midst of your situation and you don't have to doubt and you don't have to fear. Do you not know that when doubt comes, it comes as a result of you being not just uncertain, not certain, it and, and not sure. It comes from you being fearful because if you've been in a situation for so long and, and life looks like it's just, you know, disappointed you, you face nothing but disappointments in. Uh, rejection and you know the disapproval all your life and nothing seems like it's working in your favor you tend to grow into a mode of can anything good happen and when it does can i receive it how long will it last and so you have to gather your mind and your heart and you have to trust and believe that this is the moment that i'm just going to trust god i'm just going to have faith in god i'm not going to doubt god why because you're still here, you're still living. And you're here not just because, you know, uh, fine cars and things like that, but God has a purpose for your life to use you for his glory. And so many times the enemy wants you to doubt, why do you exist? Why are you living? Why are you on this job? Why are you doing this particular ministry? Why are you in this ministry? Why why aren't you, you know, doing things, you know, that they're in your skill set? Because God has you in a place for right now until he takes you where he's going to take you. Amen. So I, I wanted to say that. And the reason why he walks on the water, he's giving stability to the sea. That even in the midst of the wind fighting and being contrary because remember, what's causing these waves and causing, you know, the back and forth of the ship is when the water and the wind meet together to cause what? The friction. It's a friction and it causes the waves of the sea to so that the sea is going back and forth and it's causing anything that is on the sea to what? Rock back and forth. So here it is. Jesus is seeing this. He walks on the water. And here it is, his disciples see him walking on the water and they're what? Concerned, they're troubled, they're worried, they're scared. Why? Because they're saying it is a spirit. And anytime you see somebody walking on the water, they see Jesus walking on the water. Here it is, he's walking on the sea. He's not speaking to the wind that is contrary because in the midst of your test and trial, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the midst of your test and trial, he's walking on what? the sea because he's giving he's what he's letting you know i'm with you while you're on the sea he's letting you know i'm with you while you're in the midst of the attack i'm with you when you're in the lion's den i'm with you when you're in what the fiery furnace i'm with you when the enemy is persecuting your soul in other words i'm not going to stop you know the enemy from fighting just yet but I'm going to be with you to give you what stability, to give you strength, to give you peace, to give you what calm, to give that the enemy know that nothing that you do is going to rock my child. The scripture lets us know, I believe it's in Romans, the fifth chapter. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed, perplexed. That means confused, but not despair. Thank you, Jesus. That means we may have a moment where 
we're kind of like confused and we don't understand everything that is going on. He said we're perplexed, but what not in despair. We're not without hope. Without we're not without expectation. Cast down, but not forsaken. Persecuted. That means we're not left. Persecuted. That means we're being afflicted, but not what he says. He says persecuted, but not what he said persecuted, but not destroyed. In other words, you may afflict me, but you can't destroy me. Why? Because I'm in the hands of God and God only lets you do it for a season. Trouble only lasts for a season, beloved. You got to stay in faith and you cannot doubt God. Why? Because God has never lost the case. God has never failed you. And you got to believe and you got to stand on that. Many things in your life, go back to a memorial and remember what God has said to you and God has brought you through. That means that this situation is no different. So when doubt rises up, doubt cannot stay here. Doubt cannot be in my heart. I can't doubt God now. I know too much about him. I can't doubt God now because he's brought me through too many tests and trials. I can't doubt God. Why? Because God is a God of his word. He's not like all these other gods. He is the God. He is supreme ruler and supreme authority. He said, I am that I am. And that's what he told Moses. Tell them I am. He said, the Lord, Moses said, Lord, who so I should who shall I say send me? He said, I am that I am have sent you. In other words, everything that you need me to be, I am the one that is sending you unto this people. So beloved, when you feel like doubt is settling in, start trusting and believing God and call that word back to remembrance. Do not be in a place of uncertainty. Do not have a place in your heart where you're not sure. You are sure. You know what God has done. You've been in that place before. You've been in troubled times before. You've been in tight spots before. You've been in spots where the enemy was coming against you. And God said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You've been in a place where God has let you know, and my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. You've been in this place before where he says, thank you, or you shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. You're wounded for my transgressions and bruised for my iniquities and with his stripes you are healed. He took upon himself our sicknesses and, and our griefs and he bore them. You've been in that place where you've been sick before. Has God ever failed you? Absolutely not. Why? Because he's let you know that I'm still the God of yesterday as I am today. I am the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So here it is. They see him and they're crying out because they're thinking and they're crying out for fear. Why? Because they're looking at him and they're thinking that they're seeing a spirit, which is really him himself, walking on what? The sea. He's calming the sea because the sea is representation of you. You represent this. Thank you, Jesus. That place, that place you represent, that place where God has given you stability. The sea is representation of the, of the area and the dwelling place of where you are, where the enemy is trying to disrupt your peace. So he's trying to disrupt what your foundation and that place that you're standing on. You're standing on the rock. And so what he, Itamashaya, thank you, Jesus. And so what he's trying to do is he's trying to create a friction between you and the sea. My God, thank you, Lord, to try to get what? That boat to start rocking. And what Jesus does, Jesus stabilizes your mind so that your mind doesn't get caught up in what vacillating. Can he do it? Will he do it? How is he going to do it? I need to know the details. No, you don't. Why? Because God is in control, beloved. And no matter what you're facing, no matter what the enemy fights you with, you rep that, that C is representation of what God is standing on. He's standing on what? He's standing on your problem. He's standing on your, your attack. He's standing. Why? He's standing on that place that is supposed to be stable any other time. And what is he doing? He's not speaking to the wind, which is creating what? the boisterous and 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 what is creating what the waves crazy and creating that boat to what rock back and forth he is basically standing on you to let you know i am in you i am for you i am with you so no matter what the enemy comes at you with the wind can beat against it but he cannot what he can't rock this boat why because i'm standing on your suffering i'm standing on your problem and because i'm standing on it I am with you. Here it is. And straightway Jesus spake unto them. And he said, what? Be of good cheer. Why? 
Why did he tell them to be a good cheer? And I wanted to say this also. When Jesus was alone, he got alone to himself. Why? Because there are times that you need to get alone with God in that private place, removing all the distractions so that you can hear from God and listen to God, so that you can hear that still small voice what speak unto you. Here it is. Peter is saying it to him. He says, but, but straightway Jesus spake unto them. Because see, sometimes when when God, when you're in turbulent situations and you're going through so much and so much is coming at you and you feel like you've been hit on every side and um, from every angle, God has to calm your spirit down. Here it is. He says, straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Because sometimes when he comes in to rescue you, you're afraid to accept that peace. You're afraid to accept that joy. You're afraid to accept the favor of God because you've been down for so long. You've had, you've been beat down for so long a time until you don't know how to receive the hand of God coming in and giving you that peace, that tranquility, that calmness, that quietness from fear of evil until you just, you wrestle in your mind, is this really, how long is this going to last? Is it from God? And so he has to remind you I am the God of your peace, my God. I thank you, Jesus. And then here it is. He says, and Peter said unto him, he's, now Peter is now wanting to do what? He wants to do what Jesus is doing. Jesus is showing him that even in the midst of what you're going through, you can do what I'm giving you the power to do. I'm giving you the power to do what I'm doing. Here it is. Peter sees him. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, if it be you, bid me come unto thee on the water. The word bid means to order or request. It means to urge. So here we're going to see that he's telling him, he's going to, he said, Lord, if it be you, then order me. Allow me, request me to do what? To come unto you. And so he does. And he says unto him, he says, come. In other words, come. That's all he said, come. Because he's allowing them to see that what you're seeing, the, the things that I'm doing, greater works than these shall you do. I don't care if you're opening up a business and I don't care if it looks like, you know, you're being fought on every side, on every angle. I don't care if your body's under attack. God is letting you know that I am the one that is standing upon what? The sea. I'm calming that place where you have that, that place where it should be calm at all times. The thing that is trying to disrupt your peace is that wind. And so what I'm doing, I'm standing, my God, on that seat. I'm standing on you. I'm standing, I'm covering you. That's what I want to say. I'm covering you. That's what he's doing. I'm covering you. I'm with you in the midst of this. So you don't have to be afraid. And here it is. And when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water to what go to Jesus. Here it is. We have the ship, we have the wave, and we have what? The wind. What is causing in the in the sea? What is causing the, the sea to be to experience what? The turbulence. Okay, it's when the wind and what? The sea come together. And what? The wind is boisterous and is causing waves to formulate. Why? Because there is a turbulence between the two. And so what's happening is it's causing the ship to rock back and forth. Here it is. He comes out to Jesus walking on the water. He's walking on the very water that is really under attack from the wind, which is causing the waves, the currents to be back and forth. Here it is. Say, Tamashaya. Here it is. He's trusting Jesus. He's trusting him that when Jesus is on the water with him, that means that as he is in the midst of your pain, he's in the midst of what you're suffering. Jesus is in the midst of what your, your fire. He's in the midst of the enemy trying to do everything that he can to destroy you. Jesus is in the midst. And what is he doing? He's letting you know that as long as you keep your eyes on me, you can do this. You can make it. You can overcome this. And so here it is. He's looking at Jesus and he's coming out to Jesus. Picture him walking on the water to go to Jesus. And when he saw the wind, when he looked at what was out, when he looked at what the wind, because there are times that the enemy distracts you and he wants you to look at what your present circumstance is to get you to a place. That's why he wants you to doubt God. 
And when he does that, he wants you to look at where you are. He wants you to look at if you're in a homeless situation. He wants you to look at the bills. He wants you to look at, you know, all of the attacks that he's throwing at you. He wants you to look at the pain. He wants you to look at the, the persecution. He wants you to look at the tests and trials that are coming against you. He wants you to look at your enemy as though your enemy had power to completely destroy you, which he does not. He wants you to be afraid of the boss on your job. He wants you to be afraid, thank you, Lord, that everything that you have, you're going to lose it all in one season. What he's doing is he's creating doubt in your mind. He's creating doubt in your confidence. Do you not know that the enemy attacks people's confidence? And when he attacks your confidence, he tries to make you unsure. The strategy is to make you unsure and uncertain that you are qualified for promotion, qualified to do a great job, qualified to own your own businesses, qualified to own a house, qualified, my God, to do great and mighty things for the kingdom of God. Why does he do that? Because he wants you to look at who you are to say you're disqualified, your past disqualifies you. And he wants people to make you look at, he wants you, people to look at you as a still the same person that you used to be. And what he does is he uses them to cause you to doubt yourself, to doubt your abilities, your capabilities, to doubt, you know, your, your skills and your anointing. Do you not know that he does all of this as a strategy to cause you to be not sure in within yourself? And it caused you not to walk in the confidence of the Holy Ghost. God said that he gave us power that should over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by enemies harm us. Beloved, God gave us the authority to keep the enemy up underneath our feet. We got power. Thank you, Jesus. Power from the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost inside of us is God inside of us in spirit form. Jesus. So when you have that, why are you doubting? Why are you not sure? My God, it's impossible to please God unless you have faith. He said, for without faith, it's impossible to please God. That means your faith is what's going to sustain. Your faith is what's going to take you from here to there. Your faith is what you have to stand upon. Your faith is your conviction that I believe God, yet I don't see it. I believe God and I believe that and you can believe God so much so and have a confidence and a trust in God that as you walk in God, thank you, Jesus, that you believe that you already got the manifestation. He says, faith come by hearing and hearing about what the word of God he said, now faith is the sense of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So when we believe God, we have to believe it until, my God, until we already have it in our mind, in our heart, and in our hands before we even receive it in a tangible, a tangible, a visible um, substance, my God. So you have to understand, beloved, doubt cannot stay here. Doubt cannot stay here. You must protect your peace. Why? The peace of God. Doubt cannot stay. God says, I'm going to heal you. Stand on his word. God says, I'm going to deliver your loved ones. Stand on his word. God says, he's going to bring you out. Stand on his word. Do not doubt him. Don't let doubt enter into your mind. Keep having, block the doubt with faith. Thank you, Lord. Block the doubt with faith. When you block that doubt with faith and you say, I believe God, I believe God. Every time he tries, and Satan will not just bring the word doubt. He'll bring the, the manifestation of the doubt. And how does he do that? He causes you to be unsure or uncertain. That's what doubt is. He causes you to second guess your ability, to second guess God. And when you second guess God, God cannot bless you and he cannot bring forth the promise. Why? Because you can be right there at the door, but when you doubt, you're talking yourself out of the promises of God out of the favor of God, out of the blessings of God, out of the miracles of God, because he moves in faith. He moves by our faith and by what we believe and faith without works is dead. So you got to move in faith and you got to stay in faith. So we move all of that doubt. Here it is when he looks at what? The wind, because he's looking at what? That's like the devil. You're looking at the attack that the enemy is sending. And what does it do? He was afraid and he began to sink. Fear not, beloved, fear not. And he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus straight stretched forth his hand and called him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? 
And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Now, isn't it amazing how when they came into the ship, the wind stopped? Why did it stop? Because there was a faith in action taking place. And so anytime you're going to act in faith on anything that you're going to do, doubt is going to visit you. Doubt is going to be present. Why? Because doubt is there to what? To, to stop your progress, to stop you before you even begin. And when you begin, it is there to stop you as far as progressing. And it is there to stop you midway into you persevering and pursuing and pressing in. And then what it is, he wants to what? Stop you from completing the assignment that God has for your life and completing what? The vision and that goal. That's why doubt is there. But doubt cannot stay here. Doubt cannot stay here. Why? Because faith is here. And faith says, I will succeed. I will accomplish it. And I will get the victory. That's what doubt says. Doubt, faith says, I will succeed. I will accomplish it. And I will get the victory. Faith says, no matter what you come at me with, I'm still going to move in faith. I'm still believing that it's going to be done. And in my mind, there is no doubt. There is no uncertainty. There is no, I'm not sure. I believe God because God is the one that's going to make it happen. God is the one that's going to bring it to pass. And with him, because without faith, it's impossible to please him. Here the scripture says, he said, with God, all things are possible to him that believes. In other words, he says, have faith in God. For whoso shall say unto this moment, be thou moon cast into the sea, and shall not what doubt in his heart. And shall believe those things which he said for speak if shall come to pass. He's gonna say he's gonna have it. He's gonna have whatsoever he said. Therefore I say unto you, and this is in Mark, I believe it's in uh 10, 11, 24. He said, Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever you say, thank you, Jesus. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire, you long for when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. And that is in Mark eleven, twenty-three and twenty-four. So we see here. That while he's walking on the water, my God, my God, thank you, Jesus. He said, O oh, ye of little faith, O oh, thou of little faith. Many Peter, you had faith. He didn't say he didn't have no faith. He said of little faith. And normally, you know, the mustard seed faith will help you. He said, but in this situation, you got, he said, where did you? He said, O oh, thou of little faith. He said, wherefore didst thou doubt? You were doing fine. You were walking towards me. You were coming. You were almost there. Where did you doubt it? And he doubted when he looked at what he was, what was around him. And many times that's what Satan does. He causes the enemy to speak a word in your spirit. That's why you got to protect when God gives you a dream or a vision. Protect that word and don't speak it to everybody. Because everybody can't handle what has been spoken in your life. And you got to guard it. And you got to work towards the instruction and the vision of goals that God has mandated or instructed you to and giving you details. In. in other words, when God gives you the details of how to bring it to pass, how He how he's going to bring it to pass, he wants you to follow his instructions so that as you walk in obedience to his what direction, you're going to finish and you're going to accomplish that vision, dream, and goal and that assignment on your life. And not only accomplish it, God is going to take you higher and elevate you to do great and mighty things. So, beloved, I want you to understand and say this. Doubt cannot stay here. Why? You've got to protect your peace. Doubt cannot stay here. I believe God. Say it with me. I believe God. And I believe that everything that he said he's going to do in my life, it shall come to pass. I believe God. Denounce it in Jesus' name. Father God, we thank you for this word today. We thank you for the anointing and for the understanding of your word. And Lord God, I ask right now that you would cast out the spirit of doubt unto every heart and in every mind, oh God, that has just received this word. I ask, oh God, that you would destroy that spirit of doubt. Destroy, Lord God, it from the root, oh God. Destroy it even right now as it tries to enter and tries to block and hinder that word which was sown in their heart and in their soul and their mind. Cause the spirit of faith to sustain them and to arise and to guard them. Cause the spirit of faith to be a shield, a shield round about their ears and round about their heart and round about their soul and their mind. 
Bless each and every heart, Lord God, to stay in faith, stand in faith, and to accomplish it in faith. And Father, we thank you for what you've done and for what you're going to do. And until we come back again, bless and cover them with your precious blood. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, beloved, till we meet again, love you to life. Bye-bye. Hey, don't forget, like and subscribe. Bye-bye.